scrutiny of the alleged references to Muhammad in the Bible as a prophet. They absolutely have no relation to the prophet of Muhammad, nor prophesy his coming. Uh, Muhammad is not mentioned in the Old Testament. Muhammad is not mentioned anywhere in Genesis and the Revelation. The Muhammad is God to master. That's a joke. Lo, we inspire thee as we inspired Noah and the prophets after him, as we inspired Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes, and Jesus and Job and Jonah and Aaron and Solomon, and as we imparted unto David the Psalms. The verse we've just heard is from chapter 4 of the Quran. In the verse, God is affirming to humanity that Muhammad is indeed the recipient of a divine guidance, just as Noah, Abraham, and the rest of the prophets. However, some Christians and Jews today don't believe that Muhammad was a prophet and the covenant that God made with Abraham. And since the Quran is not their book of authority, in this video I'm going to show you that the book you're holding in your hands contains the name of the seal of prophethood, the Prophet Muhammad. As known, the Old Testament was preserved in the Hebrew language. In the fifth chapter of the Shir Hashirim, which is one of the five Medjolit or sacred scrolls that are part of the Hebrew Bible, or for short the Song of Solomon, as Christians know it today. That chapter is discussing someone. Jews will say it is discussing Solomon, while Christians will say it is discussing Jesus. Considering this is the Songs of Solomon, it would seem logical that it is discussing Solomon. The verses, describing this mystery man, have the narrator's speech conjugated in the feminine, meaning it is a woman who is describing this man. So it is possible that it is one of Solomon's wives discussing her husband Solomon. However, Christians assert that Jesus is being discussed, and that the chapter is describing a man who was not yet alive at that point. A prophecy. In reading the English translation of Song of Songs 5.16, it finishes the description by saying, He is altogether lovely but what most people don't know, is that the name of that man, was given in the original Medjolet. Here is verse 16, and how it is written in ancient Hebrew, before introducing the vowels, in the 8th century. From the Hebrew Bible, on scripturetext.com. Here is the word in question. This word is made of four letters. Mem. Het. Mem. Dalit. Now when reading the word as it is written in its original form, with no vowels, it can be read as Muhammad, which is the name of the Muslim prophet, or as Mamad with no A after the H. According to Ben Yehuda's Hebrew English Dictionary, it is correctly pronounced as Muhammad, not Mamad. So how we're going to know for sure if it's pronounced as Muhammad, the Muslim prophet, or as Mamad, a random Hebrew word, the only way is to give the verse to a rabbi and say to him please read. Here is the Song of Songs 516, and how it is read by a rabbi from a Hebrew Jewish site. Please notice, the in in Hebrew, is a plural of respect. Hikoman takim, 
بخلو محمد 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 دیم زید و دیو زرعی به نوکی روشلائی حکو منتقیم به خلو محمد دیم زید و دیو زرعی به نوک یروشلائی حکو منتقیم به خلو محمد 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 دیم زید و دیو زرعی به نوک یروشلائی Here is the famous SDL translation tool which includes a professional human translation as well as an online translation. We're going to copy our Hebrew word of the Song of Songs directly from the Jewish site. It's the same site where you can hear the rabbi reading the verse in Hebrew. All links are in the description. So, we're going to copy the word and paste it and ask, please translate. Are they going to translate the meaning of the name of that person? as the Bible translators did. Which is the praise and the lovely one or are they going to keep the name as it is? Well, see it yourself. Here is the world lingo translator. The result is the same. It's Muhammad. Let's discuss what do the Hindu scriptures have to speak about the last and final prophet, the Antim Rishi. It's mentioned in the Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhyay 3, Shlokas 10 to 27. It says that the Malaychas have spoiled the land of the Arabs. There is an enemy who's causing mischief. I will send a man by the name of Muhammad to defeat this enemy and to guide the people. O Raja, you need not go to the foolish land of Pishachas. I, with my grace, will purify you here. A person of injury disposition comes to Raja and says, Arya Dharam will prevail in the world. The religion of truth will prevail in the world. I have been sent by Ishwar Paramatma and my followers will be those who will be circumcised, who will not have a shandy, a tail on the head. They will grow a beard. They will create a revolution. They will give the call for prayers. They will eat all lawful things, but will not eat the flesh of swine. They will not be purified by herbs or shrubs, but will be purified by warfare. They will be called Muslims. They will be a creed of meat eaters. Now this prophecy, if you analyze, refers to no one but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It says that the enemies will be defeated by a man called as Muhammad. His name is mentioned. Peace be upon him. And he will guide the people. And we know Prophet Muhammad led the Arabs from darkness to light. It further says that the followers of this Prophet, referring to the Muslims, they will be people who are circumcised. They will not have a tail on the head. They will grow a beard. They will create a revolution. They will give the call for prayer that the Azan. They will eat all lawful things, but will not eat the flesh of swine. They will not be purified by herbs and shrubs, but by warfare. They will be called Muslims. They will be a community of meat eaters. All these prophesy no one but Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his followers, the Muslims. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been prophesied in several places in Bhavishya Purana. Time doesn't permit us to go to the details, I'll just give a reference of a couple. He's prophesied in Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhya 3, Shlokas 5 to 8. He's also prophesied in Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khand 1, 
Adhya 3, Shlokas 21 to 23, the Prophet Muhammad has even been prophesied in several places in the Atharva Ved. It's mentioned in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 127, Shlokas 1 to 14. These are called as the Kuntub Suktas. Kuntub in Sanskrit means the hidden glands in the abdomen. Referring to the meanings of the shlokas are hidden, they will be known later on. Due to shortage of time, we'll just discuss the first four in brief. The first mantra says, He will be Narashansa. He will be Kaurama. He will be protected from 60,090 enemies. Mantra number two says, He will be a camel riding Rishi. Mantra number three says, he will be Mama Rishi. Mantra number four says, He is Vashvis Reb. The first mantra says, He is Narashansa. Narashansa in Sanskrit, it derived from the word Nar, meaning a man or a person, and Shansa means praiseworthy. How we know in Hindi we say Prashansa? So Shansa is the same thing. So Narashansa means a person who is praiseworthy. And if you translate Muhammad, peace be upon him, from Arabic to English, it means the praiseworthy. So Narashansa is the Sanskrit translation of the Arabic word Muhammad, peace be upon him. The first mantra further says, He is Kaurama. One of the meaning of Kaurama, it means the Prince of Peace. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the Prince of Peace. The other meaning of Kaurama is an immigrant. And the Prophet migrated from Makkah to Medina. And the verse also says, he will defeat 60,090 enemies. And we know the population of Makkah, that was again Prophet Muhammad sallam, was approximately 60,000. Mantra number two says, he will be a camel riding Rishi, indicating he will not be an Indian Rishi, he will not be a Brahmin. Because Manusmiti, chapter number 11, verse number 202 says, a Brahmin cannot ride a camel or an ass. So this means it cannot be Indian Rishi, it cannot be a Brahmin, it has to be a foreign Rishi, a foreigner. Mantra number 3 says, he is Mama Rishi, also meaning Maharishi, means a great Rishi. Or some place it says Muhammad, that's the name of Prabhupada Sallallahu The fourth mantra says, he is Reb. Reb means one who praises. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was also called as Ahmad, the peace be upon him, which means one who praises, and the Prophet was called the one who praises, which is the translation of the Sanskrit word, Reb. He has been prophesied in several other places in Atharva Ved. He is also prophesied in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 6. It says that Akaru, meaning the praiseworthy man, he will defeat 10,000 enemies without a battle. This refers to the battle of Azab, battle of Khandak, which Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa we know that he was the one who was praiseworthy. And he won the battle of Khandak, battle of Azab, in which the enemies were approximately 10,000 without the battle being fought. He is also prophesied in Atharva Ved, book number 20, Hymn number 21, verse number 7, saying that the Abandu, by God's help, will defeat 20 chiefs. Abandu means an orphan, it also means one who praises. Both of this refer to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And he will defeat 20 chiefs. We know from history that approximately in Makkah, there were approximately 20 tribes. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he won the battle of Makkah and defeated all these 20 chiefs. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is even prophesied in Rig Ved, book number 1, hymn number 53, verse number 9. The same prophecy but the word is changed, it's called as Sushrama. And Sushrama again means one who praises, the translation of the word Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is also prophesied in the Psalm Ved in Agni Mantra number 64. It says, that he will not be fed by his mother. His mother will not breastfeed him. And after that, he will become a prophet. And we know, it was Arab custom, that 
the children are normally breastfed by the wet nurse. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was breastfed by Halima. May Allah please sir. There are various prophecies of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in several places in the Vedas. He is also prophesied in some way in Uttarchik, Manzana number 1500. It says that Ahmad will be given the eternal law. Ahmad, as I mentioned earlier, is another name for Prophet Muhammad, meaning one who praises. He will be given the eternal law, referring to the Quran. Some way says, he has been given the eternal law. But since Ahmad is a non Sanskrit word, the translators could not understand what is the meaning of Ahmad. So they broke the word into Eh and Miti. And now they translate as I alone. So it means I alone have been given eternal law. So if we read the translation, it says I alone have been given the eternal law. But actually, it should read as Ahmad has been given the eternal law. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been prophesied as Ahmad in several places in the Vedas. He is also prophesied in the Vedas in some way in Indra, mantra number 152. He is prophesied in Jajiru Ved, chapter number 31, verse number 18. He is prophesied in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 6, verse number 10. In Atharva Ved, book number 8, hymn number 5, verse number 16. In Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 126, verse number 14. In several places, he has been prophesied as Ahmad, which was another name of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the one who praises. Furthermore, the last and final messenger has been prophesied as Narashansa in several places in the Vedas. As I mentioned earlier, Narashansa is derived from the word Nar, meaning a person or man, and Shansa as Prashansa means the praiseworthy. A man who is praiseworthy, which is exactly the translation of the Arabic word Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been prophesied as Narashansa, as Muhammad, peace be upon him, in several places in the Vedas. He is prophesied in Rig Ved, book number 1, hymn number 13, verse number 3. In Rig Ved, book number 1, hymn number 18, verse number 9. In Rig Ved, book number 1, hymn number 106, verse number 4. In Rig Ved, book number 1, Hymn number 942, verse number 3. In Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 3, verse number 2. In Rig Ved, book number 5, hymn number 5, verse number 2. In Rig Ved, book number 7, hymn number 2, verse number 2. In Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 64, verse number 3. In Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 182, verse number 2. In Yajur Ved, chapter number 20, verse number 37. Yajur Ved, chapter number 20, verse number 57. Yajur Ved, chapter number 21, verse number 31. Yajur Ved, chapter number 21, verse number 55. Yajur Ved, chapter number 28, verse number 2. Yajur Ved, chapter number 28, verse number 19. Yajur Ved, chapter number 28, verse number 42. You can keep on quoting only references. He has been mentioned as Narashansa in several places in the Vedas. You can only give a talk for several hours together about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mentioned in the Hindu scriptures. I'll just mention another one last prophecy. He has been prophesied as the Kalki Autar, the final Autar, the Antim Rishi. It's mentioned in the Puranas about the Kalki Autar, about his coming. It's mentioned in the Bhagavata Purana. Khan 12, Adhyay 2, Shlokas 18 to 20. It says that in the house of Vishnu Yash, the revered priest, Brahman priest, of the village of Sambhala will be born the Kalki Avatar. It further says that he will be Lord of the worlds and he will have unsurpassed qualities and character. He will be given specially eight criteria, and he will be given by the angels a steed horse, a fleet horse, and he will ride a white horse with the sword in his hand. He will defeat the miscreant devil people, and he will be savior to the world. It further says in Bhagavad Purana, Khan 1, Adhyay 3. Shloka 25 
that in Kali Yug, where kings become robbers, there will be a savior who will be born in the house of Vishnu Yash. His name shall be Kalki. He even prophesies in the Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 4, that in the house of Vishnu Yash, the chief of the village of Sambhala will be born Kalki Avatar. Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 5 says that he will along with four companions defeat the evil people. Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 7 says that he will be helped by the angels in the battlefield. Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 11 says that in the house of Vishnu Yash, in the womb of Sumati, the Kalki Avatar will be born. And further says in Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 15, that he will be born on the 12th of the first half of the month of Madhav. Now all these prophecies refer to no one but the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Point number one, he will be born in the house of Vishnu Yash. That means his father's name will be Vishnu Yash. And we know that the name of the father of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was Abdullah. Vishnu Yash means the follower, the obedient of Vishnu. And Abdullah means the obedient, the worshipper of Almighty God. His mother's name will be Sumati. Sumati in Sanskrit means one who is peaceful. And the name of Prophet Muhammad mother was Amina, which also means peaceful. It says he will be born in the village by the name of Sambala. Sambala in Arabic means a place which is of peace and security. And we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was born in Makkah, which is also called as Darul Aman, which means a place of security and peace. It further says that he will be born in the house of the chief of Sambala. And we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in the house of the chief of Makkah. It further says he will be born on the twelfth day of the first half of the month of Madhav. And we know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was born on the twelfth of the first half of the month of Rabbi Awal. It further says that the Kalki Avatar, he will be an Antim Rishi, the last Rishi. And we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the last and final messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as is mentioned in Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 40. It further says that he will receive guidance from Parshuram in the mountain and then he'll go towards the north and come back. We know he received the first guidance to Archangel Gabriel in Garahira, in jabal nur that is the mountain of light. And later he migrated from Makkah, that is northwards, and he comes back to Makkah later. It further says that he will have qualities which are unsurpassed in character, as Allah says in the Quran, in chapter number 68, verse number 4, it says that verily thou art standard on the highest standard of character. Thou art standard on the highest standard of character. It further says that this Kalki Avatar will be given eight special qualities. Referring to, he will be wise, he will have self-control, he will have respectable lineage, he will also have revealed knowledge, he will have valor and strength. He will have measured speech. He will have the qualities of being charitable. And he will also be very kind. All these eight criteria and characteristics refer to no one but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. It fits his character exactly. It further says that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, he will be given the steed horse by Shiva. And we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given the Burak, the Almighty God, by which he went to Miraj, the ascension to heaven. It further says he will ride a white horse and will have the sword in the right hand. We know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
he took part in most of the battles, most of which were in self-defense. He took active part, he even rode the horse and had the sword in the right hand. It further says that he will be a savior of humankind. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 24, and Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, it says, Wama arsalnaka, that we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to the whole of humankind. And he has been sent as a guidance to the whole humankind. But most of the men yet do not know. He has also said that he will guide the people to the right path. And we know Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was the days of Yom al and he guided them from darkness to light. It further says that he will be supported by four companions who will spread the message. And we know the four companions mentioned refer to Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, and Hazrat Ali. May Allah be pleased with them all. And it further says that he will be helped by the angels in the battlefield. And we know in the battle of Badr, Angels helped Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to win the battle. It's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse 123 and 125. It's also mentioned in chapter number 8, verse number 8 and 9. These prophecies undoubtedly refer to no one but the last and final messenger of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's been referred as the last Rishi, Antim Rishi, the last and final messenger. He was neither tall and lanky, nor short and heavy set. When he looked at someone, he looked them in the eyes. He was the most generous hearted of men, the most truthful of them in speech, the most mild tempered of them, and the noblest of them in lineage. Anyone who would describe him would say, I never saw before or after him the like of him, Muhammad, described by a contemporary. Muhammad was a man who faced an absolutely hopeless situation. There was a whole continent, virtually, of people killing one another in an endless, hopeless vendetta, going down a chute of violence and warfare, feeling that society was coming to an end and had no hope. He gave them hope, single-handedly, in a space of 23 years, he brought peace and new hope to Arabia and a new beacon for the world. Islam the religion Muhammad first brought to Arabia now claims 1.2 billion followers around the world. There are an estimated 7 million Muslims in America, where it is the country's fastest growing religion and the most diverse. Like America itself, the Muslims in this country come from all over the world. They have a common bond, not only in their religious faith and in their mosques, but in this story of Muhammad, they all look to it. This is the source of how to behave, of how to be a constructive citizen, of how to be a good parent, of how to be a good child, of how to seek knowledge and truth. These are values that are expressed most clearly for Muslims in the story of Muhammad. In the Quran, Allah says that Muhammad is the best example of behavior for you. And that's what he is, the guide for the way we deal with each other. And when we're in a position of authority, how we attempt to implement justice and law. Prophet Muhammad, he asked the question to people around him. Do you love your creator? Serve your fellow man first. What does that tell you? It tells you, forget about all this intellectual, yeah, I love God and this and that. If you're going to, you know, forget about talking the talk, walk the walk. You want to serve God, serve people. What more noble way to serve people than to risk your own life to save them? September 11th 
has changed the whole world. And it has also put the Muslim community in the spotlight. How about the dove installation? Is this? Muslims have a lot of hostility being hurled at them. But this is also a time of transformation. Many people are very eager to understand Islam and want to know who is the Prophet, what is the Quran, who are the Muslims, how do they live? Through the stories about Prophet Muhammad, we were able to make connections and all of a sudden you would feel that you could relate to things that happened 1500 years ago and that the issues weren't old-fashioned, they were universal and that's what he's taught me. This is the story Muslims have passed down from generation to generation for 1400 years. A story about the merchant, husband, father, statesman, and warrior, whom they consider the final prophet. The man whose legacy continues to shape their lives today. The life of Muhammad is, even in its details, probably better known than any other major religious figure before modern times. His followers made careful efforts to record memories that they had of things that he had said and things that he had done. Many of these traditions may have been made up later on, but at the core, there seems to me to be little reason to doubt that there is a picture and a portrait of a living man. According to Muslim sources, Muhammad bin Abdullah, or son of Abdullah, was born in the year 570 in the city of Mecca, in what is today Saudi Arabia. A poet of the times described Mecca as a place where winter and summer were equally intolerable. The world into which Muhammad arrived was a brutal one, defined by hunger, violence, and tribal warfare. You could not exist without your tribe. An individual in this dangerous world had absolutely no chance of survival. And that meant that the tribe had become perhaps the most sacred value in Arabia. It's a society that's based on the idea of vigilantism, that if somebody attacked my clan, then I have a right to go and attack anyone from his clan. They saw justice as taking revenge. The Arabs of the 6th century had no written code of law, no common religion, and no central government. In this dangerous world, Muhammad had the good fortune to be born into Mecca's powerful tribe, the Quraysh. But his father died before he was born, and his mother died when he was only six. His uncle, Abu Talib, was left to raise the young orphan. He surely had to have worried about his, his future, what will he be? And so he, he must have been a very introspective child. Muhammad had the habit of going out in the desert and contemplating the stars and thinking about why he was an orphan and how would life be to him in the future. Orphans were marginal people and he felt very, very strongly identified with the poor and disadvantaged for the rest of his life. The Mecca of Muhammad's youth was both a religious and a commercial center, located at the crossroads of two major trading routes. Pilgrims came from all over Arabia to worship the hundreds of idols that surrounded the Kaaba, an ancient shrine in the heart of the city. The Kaaba was surrounded by a sacred area where fighting was not allowed. The commerce generated by the pilgrims made it possible for a young man in Muhammad's circumstances to make a living in the markets of Mecca. Soon, Muhammad began acting as an agent for wealthy merchants, taking their goods on caravans throughout Arabia. These 
these journeys exposed him to a variety of other tribes and communities and a range of new ideas. He probably learned the differences that exist between different tribes, people speaking different languages. He encountered Christians and Jews and learned from them what their faith, what their religion, what their cultures are. Muhammad would have become aware that for the Jews and the Christians, the Holy Scripture was very important. Both got scriptures in which God had sent a sacred message to prophets. And this was a way in which people could relate to the divine. Muhammad's bloodless conquest of Mecca was clear proof that his movement was succeeding. And what's more, his message of justice and using peace and reconciliation as a means of delivering that message was beginning to attract huge numbers of converts. In fact, tribes were beginning to convert wholesale. By 631, the last pagan stronghold of Taif fell. Now, Muhammad was effectively the ruler of the whole of Muslim Arabia. More than 20 years had passed since he had received his first revelation. For over a decade, he and his followers had eked out a precarious existence. Time after time, they had been on the verge of destruction, but they had managed to survive through a combination of Muhammad's spiritual, military and political leadership. And finally, after a seemingly humiliating treaty, to triumph over their enemies. Mohammed expressed and exemplified the qualities that we now see universally are characteristic of a good leader and a leader for good. Enthusiasm, integrity, then the combination of toughness and demandingness and fairness was very important in leaders universally and Mohammed had all those attributes very clearly. I think warmth Humanity, kindness is important too. And again, if you look at the traditions of the life of Muhammad, there are plenty of examples where he showed those kind of uh, humane qualities. By the year 632, Muhammad had achieved almost all that he had set out to achieve. He created a level of peace and security that Arabia had rarely known. He laid out the foundations and the rules of Islam, and he created the foundations of a new Muslim community. But by this time, he was 60 years old, and his health was beginning to fail. In that year, he came to Mecca for the last time, and he performed his first and only Hajj, the pilgrimage. And he gave what became known as the farewell sermon. Sitting here on a camel in the plains of Arafat, he spoke to a vast crowd with strategically placed announcers relaying his words. It was a deeply emotional speech in which, in his own words, Muhammad summarized what he felt he and his followers had achieved. O oh people, lend me an attentive ear, for I know not whether after this year I shall ever be amongst you again. Therefore listen carefully to what I am saying and take these words to those who could not be present here today. You see in the final sermon this heartfelt plea from the Prophet warning the Muslims about certain things, advising them about certain things. You can see his worries for the future of the Muslims and that these words are something that they should take note of and they should hang on to and they should be aware because in here is a very very important message for every Muslim. Do not therefore do injustice to yourselves. Remember one day you will meet Allah and answer your deeds. So beware, do not astray from the path of righteousness after I am gone. Remember what God's earliest message was to Abraham up to Adam, to Moses, to Jesus, etc. And remember that the only real reality, the ultimate reality, is the one true God. And that God is the creator, sustainer, and judge of the universe. All mankind is from Adam and Eve. 
An Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, nor a non-Arab has any superiority over an Arab. Also, a white has no superiority over black, nor a black has any superiority over white, except by piety and good action. He's saying all humans are one. God has called you from the tribalism uh, of paganism and its pride in ancestors. But remember, all men come from Adam, and Adam came from dust. And then he quotes these words from the Quran, which really speak to our time. Oh, people, God says to humanity, we have formed you from a male and a female, and have formed you into tribes and nations, so that you may get to know one another. Not so that you may fight, or oppress, or occupy, or convert, or terrorize, but so that you may get to know one another. All those who listen to me shall pass on my words to others, and those to others again. And may the last ones understand my words better than those who listen to me directly. Be my witness, O Allah, that I have conveyed your message to your people. And he asks them, O oh people, O oh Muslims, have I fulfilled my mandate to you? And they cry, Numb. Yes, and it rings around you. And he asks them three times, Have I? And each time they reply, Numb. And I think it's a most moving moment. Well, that's his summation of his life. So he emphasizes all the principles that he's been teaching for the last 23 years. He says, for example, there's no difference between Arab and non-Arab. Look after your family. So it's kind of summation of his life. If he did nothing else but simply read the last sermon, you will get the essence of the life of Muhammad. The Prophet's final sermon sets the agenda for modern contemporary Muslim society. It shows where we failed and it shows where we have to try to get to. It sums up the transformative mission that was the life of the Prophet. After his farewell pilgrimage, Muhammad returned to his small house in Medina, exhausted. He had begun to have headaches and fainting fits. He tried to attend public prayers in the mosque, but he was more and more confined to his bed where Aisha nursed him. One day, he appeared to get better, and the news spread like wildfire around the oasis. But it was only a brief reprieve. On the 8th of June, 632, Muhammad died in the house of his wife, Aisha. The news stunned his followers. Some refused to accept the truth. Panic began to take hold. How could the messenger of God be dead? His closest companion, Abu Bakr, calmed their fears, reminding them that Muhammad had never claimed to be anything other than a mere mortal and that only God is to be worshipped, not Muhammad. He was buried here, next to his mosque, his face turned towards Mecca, a practice still common today among Muslims. Within a hundred years, Muhammad's message had spread across the world, as far as India and China in the east, and as far as North Africa and Spain and France in the west. But in many ways, his struggle for a peaceful jihad was already in tatters. Within just a generation of Muhammad's death, his closest companions and family were already squabbling, breaking out into open and bloody warfare that led to the deep schism that still exists within the Muslim world today between Sunni and Shia. But today, Muhammad's message seems under threat like never before. Many Muslims feel humiliated and condemned by the sheer power of Western culture and military might, whilst many in the West see Islam as the religion of some of the most oppressive states on earth, a violent, intolerant faith. But the question is, how much of this can be blamed on Muhammad himself? Muhammad left the world with three things. His faith in God, the example of his own life, and above all else, the Qur'an itself. 
Now, people will always choose and highlight those aspects of his life they want to support their own arguments whilst ignoring the rest. But if we examine his life in total, we find that he left Arabia a better place than he found it. When faced with persecution, he chose to suffer rather than to retaliate. Although he fought many military battles, he turned his back on war when he could. His ultimate victory came through peace, not through conflict. And with that victory, he chose the path of reconciliation rather than revenge. And finally, in his farewell sermon, Muhammad left us with the most important lesson of all, that we are all equal, Arab and non-Arab, Muslim and non-Muslim. A universal message that is as relevant today as it was in 7th century Arabia. And it seems to me that this is the true legacy of the life. The following video will show you just 15 of the many selections from non-Muslims telling you what they think of the last prophet, Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Dr. William Draper, in History of Intellectual Development of Europe, four years after the death of Justinian, A.D. 569, was born in Mecca in Arabia. The man who, of all men, has exercised the greatest influence upon the human race, to be the religious head of many empires, to guide the daily life of one-third of the human race, may perhaps justify the title of a messenger of God. Philip K. Hitti, in History of the Arabs, Within a brief span of mortal life, Muhammad called forth of unpromising material a nation never wielded before. In a country that was hitherto but a geographical expression, he established a religion which in vast areas suppressed Christianity and Judaism and laid the basis of an empire that was soon to embrace within its far-flung boundaries the fairest provinces in the then civilized world. Thomas Carlyle in Heroes and Hero Worship and the Heroic in History. The lies which well-meaning zeal has heaped round this man are disgraceful to ourselves only. A silent, great soul, one of that who cannot but be earnest, he was to kindle the world. The world's maker had ordered so. Mahatma Gandhi, statement published in Young India, 1924. I wanted to know the best of the life of one who holds today an undisputed sway over the hearts of millions of mankind. I became more than ever convinced that it was not the sword that won a place for Islam in those days in the scheme of life. It was the rigid simplicity, the utter self-effacement of the Prophet, the scrupulous regard for pledges, his intense devotion to his friends and followers, his intrepidity, his fearlessness, his absolute trust in God and in his own mission. These, and not the sword, carried everything before them and surmounted every obstacle. When I closed the second volume of the Prophet's biography, I was sorry there was not more for me to read of that great life. Edward Gibbon and Simon Oakley in History of the Saracen Empire, London, 1870. The greatest success of Muhammad's life was affected by sheer moral force. It is not the propagation, but the permanency of his religion that deserves our wonder. The same pure and perfect impression which he engraved at Mecca and Medina is preserved after the revolutions of 12 centuries by the Indians, the African and the Turkish proselytes of the Quran. The Mohammedans have uniformly withstood the temptation of reducing the object of their faith and devotion to a level with the senses and imagination of man. I believe in one God, and Muhammad, the Apostle of God, is the simple and invariable profession of Islam. The intellectual image of the deity has never been degraded by any visible idol. The honors of the Prophet have never transgressed the measure of human virtue, and his living precepts have restrained the gratitude of his disciples within the bounds of reason and religion. Reverend Bosworth Smith in Muhammad and Muhammadanism, London, 1874. Head of the state as well as the church, he was Caesar and Pope in one. But he was Pope without the Pope's pretensions, and Caesar without the legions of Caesar, without a standing army, without a bodyguard, without a police force, without a fixed revenue. If ever a man ruled by a right divine, it was Muhammad, for he had all the powers without their supports. He cared not for the dressings of power, the simplicity of his private life was in keeping with his public life. In Mohammedanism, everything is different here. 
Instead of the shadowy and the mysterious, we have history. We know of the external history of Muhammad, while for his internal history, after his mission had been proclaimed, we have a book absolutely unique in its origin, in its preservation, on the substantial authority of which no one has ever been able to cast a serious doubt. Gibbon in The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, 1823. The good sense of Muhammad despised the pomp of royalty. The apostle of God submitted to the menial offices of the family. He kindled the fire, swept the floor, milked the ewes, and mended with his own hands his shoes and garments. Disdaining the penance and merit of a hermit, he observed without effort of vanity the abstemious diet of an Arab. De Lacey O'Leary in Islam at the Crossroads, London, 1923. History makes it clear, however, that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping through the world and forcing Islam at the point of sword upon conquered races is one of the most fantastically absurd myths that historians have ever repeated. Sir George Bernard Shaw in The Genuine Islam, Volume 1, Number 8, 1936. If any religion had the chance of ruling over England, nay, Europe, within the next hundred years, it could be Islam. I have always held the religion of Muhammad in high estimation because of its wonderful vitality. It is the only religion which appears to me to possess that assimilating capacity to the changing phase of existence which can make itself appeal to every age. I have studied him, the wonderful man, and in my opinion, far from being an antichrist, he must be called the savior of humanity. I believe that if a man like him were to assume the dictatorship of the modern world, he would succeed in solving its problems in a way that would bring it the much needed peace and happiness. I have prophesied about the faith of Muhammad that it would be acceptable to the Europe of tomorrow as it is beginning to be acceptable to the Europe of today. Michael Hart in The 100, a ranking of the most influential persons in history, New York, 1978. My choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others, but he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the secular and religious level. It is probable that the relative influence of Muhammad on Islam has been larger than the combined influence of Jesus Christ and St. Paul on Christianity. It is this unparalleled combination of secular and religious influence which I feel entitles Muhammad to be considered the most influential single figure in human history. W. Montgomery Watt in Muhammad at Mecca, Oxford, 1953. His readiness to undergo persecution for his beliefs, the high moral character of the men who believed in him and looked up to him as a leader, and the greatness of his ultimate achievement all argue his fundamental integrity. To suppose Muhammad an imposter raises more problems than it solves. Moreover, none of the great figures of history is so poorly appreciated in the West as Muhammad. Thus, not merely must we credit Muhammad with essential honesty and integrity of purpose, if we are to understand him at all. If we are to correct the errors we have inherited from the past, we must not forget the conclusive proof is a much stricter requirement than a show of plausibility, and in a matter such as this, only to be attained with difficulty. Washington Irving in Muhammad and his successors. He was sober and abstemious in his diet and a rigorous observer of fasts. He indulged in no magnificence of apparel, the ostentation of a petty mind, neither was his simplicity in dress affected, but a result of real disregard for distinction from so trivial a source. In his private dealings he was just. He treated friends and strangers, the rich and poor, the powerful and weak, with equity, and was beloved by the common people for the affability with which he received them and listened to their complaints. His military triumphs awakened no pride nor vain glory, as they would have done had they been effected for selfish purposes. In the time of his greatest power, he maintained the same simplicity of manners and appearance as in the days of his adversity. So far from affecting a regal state, he was displeased if, on entering a room, any unusual testimonials of respect were shown to him. If he aimed at a universal dominion, it was the dominion of faith. As to the temporal rule which grew up in his hands, as he used it without ostentation, so he took no step to perpetuate it in his family. James Michener in Islam, The Misunderstood Religion, Reader's Digest, May 1955, 
pages 68 to 70. No other religion in history spread so rapidly as Islam. The West has widely believed that this surge of religion was made possible by the sword, but no modern scholar accepts this idea, and the Quran is explicit in the support of the freedom of conscience. Like almost every major prophet before him, Muhammad fought shy of serving as the transmitter of God's word, sensing his own inadequacy. But the angel commanded, read. So far as we know, Muhammad was unable to read or write, but he began to dictate those inspired words which would soon revolutionize a large segment of the earth. There is one God. In all things, Muhammad was profoundly practical. When his beloved son, Ibrahim, died, an eclipse occurred and rumors of God's personal condolence quickly arose whereupon Muhammad is said to have announced an eclipse is a phenomenon of nature it is foolish to attribute such things to the death or birth of a human being at Muhammad's own death an attempt was made to deify him but the man who was to become his administrative successor killed the hysteria with one of the noblest speeches in religious history if there are any among you who worshiped Muhammad he is dead but if it is God you worshiped he lives forever. Lawrence E. Brown in The Prospects of Islam, 1944. Incidentally, these well-established facts dispose of the idea, so widely fostered in Christian writings, that the Muslims, wherever they went, forced people to accept Islam at the point of the sword. Alphonse de la Martin in Historie de la Turquie, Paris, 1854. Never has a man set for himself, voluntarily or involuntarily, a more sublime aim, since this aim was superhuman, to subvert superstitions which had been imposed between man and his creator, to render God unto man, and man unto God, to restore the rational and sacred idea of divinity amidst the chaos of the material and disfigured gods of idolatry then existing. Never has a man undertaken a work so far beyond human power with so feeble means, for he, Muhammad, had in the conception, as well as in the execution of such a great design, no other instrument than himself, and no other aid except a handful of men living in a corner of the desert. Finally, never has a man accomplished such a huge and lasting revolution in the world, because in less than two centuries after its appearance, Islam, in faith and in arms, reigned over the whole of Arabia and conquered in God's name Persia, Khorasan, Transoxania, Western India, Syria, Egypt, Abyssinia, all the known continent of Northern Africa, numerous islands of the Mediterranean Sea, Spain, and part of Gaul. If greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and astonishing results are the three criteria of a human genius, who could dare compare any great man in history with Muhammad? The most famous men created arms, laws, and empires only. They found it, if anything at all, no more than material powers which often crumbled away before their eyes. This man moved not only armies, legislations, empires, peoples, dynasties, but millions of men in one-third of the then-inhabited world. And more than that, he moved the altars, the gods, the religions, the ideas, the beliefs, and the souls. On the basis of a book, every letter which has become law, he created a spiritual nationality which blends together peoples of every tongue and race. He has left the indelible characteristic of this Muslim nationality, the hatred of false gods, and the passion for the one and immaterial God. This avenging patriotism against the profanation of heaven formed the virtue of the followers of Muhammad. The conquest of one-third the earth to the dogma was his miracle, or rather it was not the miracle of man, but that of reason. The idea of the unity of God proclaimed amidst the exhaustion of the fabulous Theogonies, was in itself such a miracle that upon its utterance from his lips, it destroyed all the ancient temples of idols and set on fire one-third of the world. His life, his meditations, his heroic revelings against the superstitions of his country, and his boldness in defying the furies of idolatry, his firmness in enduring them for fifteen years in Mecca, his acceptance of the role of public scorn and almost of being a victim of his fellow countrymen, this dogma was twofold the unity of God and the immateriality of God, the former telling what God is, 
the latter telling what God is not. The one overthrowing false gods with the sword, the other starting an idea with words. Philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, conqueror of ideas, restorer of rational beliefs, the founder of 20 terrestrial empires and of one spiritual empire, that is Muhammad. As regards all standards by which human greatness may be measured, we may well ask, is there any man greater than he? Mankind, listen well. I may not be with you much longer. The weak among you, feed them on what you eat, dress them as you are dressed. You will meet your God, and he will call you to account for your actions. Let those who are present warn those who are absent. You are all descended from Adam, and the best among you is he who most regards God. Think deeply about what I say. Let all your feuds be abolished. You must know that every Muslim is the brother of every other Muslim, and all Muslims are brothers one of another. Between Muslims there are no races and no tribes. Nor must you take anything from your brother except what is given freely. Do not oppress, and do not be oppressed. O oh, my people, I am but a man. It may be that the angel of death will visit me soon, and death will overtake me. But I have left you a book, revealed by God, the Koran, which is light and guidance. <laughs> 